Teens teen Marissa Middleton is no stranger to trouble. Marissa was not your typical teenager. Her focus was not on her education. She spent more time in the streets than she did at home or anywhere else. She dropped out of high school. She was headed down the wrong path. Unemployed with only a 10th grade education, Marissa mooches off her parents for financial support. And the former sophomore continues her wild child ways for the next few years. By the time she turns 19, she leaves her parents' house and stays with friends as her downward spiral gets worse. In fact, within a year of moving out from her parents' home, she was arrested for um, passing a bad check. Getting arrested is certainly a wake-up call that one is headed uh, down the wrong path. After her arrest, she moves back to her parents' home and gets a job to support herself. But after six years of trying to live a straight and narrow life, the now 26-year-old decides she needs a change of scenery. She left Colorado and moved to Manhattan, Kansas. Moving to a new town is certainly a way to start one's life over again. It adds a form of excitement in that it's different from the same old, same old. It's fresh, it's exciting, it's new. She quickly falls in love with her new home and enjoys that there's always something to do. To spark up her social life in her new town, she gets a job as a bartender at a local strip club. It's a college town, so it's got its fair amount of bars and, and whatnot. From all appearances, she was doing well there. She was able to make ends meet by working at the strip club. She was socializing with the patrons. She was making new friends. She was making a name for herself. As her new circle grows, she is particularly drawn to one man who frequents the club, 28-year-old Larry Anderson. They hung out a lot. She enjoyed spending time with him and thought he was a great guy. Larry was handsome. He had a bright smile, a slick talker. As, as time went on, they got to know each other. They talked more and more. The couple date for a few weeks going out to movies, dinners, and drinks, with Larry footing the bill at every outing. Larry seemed like a modern-day Prince Charming, and Marissa had never even asked him about, you know, what he did for a living. Marissa had had a pretty hard life, and when she met this guy, Larry, who was willing to shower her with attention and spoil her, she was quickly head over heels. But after dating for only a month, her Prince Charming's constant flow of cash sparks her curiosity. She was wondering where the, his money was coming from. She'd ask, but never got a direct answer from Larry. Then one day, while hanging out around Manhattan, he reveals his secret. According to Marissa's plea deal, he runs a small escort business in Manhattan and nearby Junction City. A lot of people that live in Junction City either work or are soldiers on Fort Riley. So those Fort Riley soldiers made up a large uh, portion of his clientele for his escort service. Even though she acknowledges her new man's way to earn a living, it's still a tough pill to swallow. To set her mind more at ease, Larry loops her in to how his little empire operates. And she was right there by his side, ride or die to the end. She made numerous trips from Manhattan to Junction City, and she was with him when he answered calls and supervised the girls. As time goes on, she has lingering questions in her mind about his relationship with some of the women he works with. When Marissa would travel to Junction City with Larry, she would notice that some of the girls got a little too close for comfort, and she did not like that. She became bothered by the girl's familiarity with Larry. She became bothered by the fact that they would call him and talk to him, that they would dress scantily in front of him. If you're insecure, you might second guess someone who has proven themselves to be really trustworthy and honest to you, but your own insecurity really makes you think twice as to what may be going on. As Marissa's anxieties grow, her relationship with Larry becomes strained, and the couple begins to argue. Marissa confronted Larry about what she suspected with the girls, and Larry just straight out denied it. He said there was no dealing other than business with the girls. But no matter how bad their fights get, the two always manage to fall back in each other's arms. And with Larry's work keeping him 25 miles away in Junction City most of the time, 
she quits her job in Manhattan and moves in with Larry to keep her boy toy company. But oftentimes she finds herself alone while he's working. She didn't have a lot to keep her busy. Fortunately, she met a couple also stationed at Fort Riley, Chantrell and Drexel Woody, and they became instant friends. Larry came into the mix and all four of them would spend time together. With Larry's business keeping him busy at all hours, Marissa shares her anxieties surrounding her man and his stable. Chantrell and Drexel, they would reassure her and, and comfort her and just pretty much dismiss the claims and just tell her nothing's going on. Sometimes people need to be reassured verbally in order to feel better about themselves and their own insecurities. But Marissa's jealousy continues to fester in her mind, and she uses social media to check up on her boyfriend. Her mind goes into overdrive when she sees a post from a local escort that insinuates that her suspicions may be spot on. She found uh, comments made by Amanda Clemens, and she said on social media that they had been sleeping together. What Marissa found on Amanda's page just crushed her view of the perfect world that she and Larry were to share. Marissa saw it and just couldn't handle it. She was beside herself. She confronts her boyfriend, to which he denies ever hooking up with the Lady of the Night. Enraged, Marissa decides to punish the woman spreading stories about her man. She had in her head that Amanda, she, she needed to be taught a lesson, and she was going to teach that lesson. Quite often when someone is in a relationship and they feel that that person is the one, they'll go to incredible lengths in order to keep that relationship and make sure no one else is getting involved in that relationship. Full of rage, Marissa vows revenge on Amanda for making up such lies. With Larry on board, the two head over to their friends Drexel and Chantrell Woody's home to enlist their help. Because Drexel had never met Amanda and she didn't know who he was, the plan was for him to pretend to be a client or at least get Amanda to invite him to a very specific location. With a strategy in place, Drexel makes the call to Amanda, which she readily accepts. Excited by the promise of two women about to battle it out for him, Larry won't be left behind, and the three drive to the hotel while Chantrell stays at home. When they arrive, Drexel knocks on the hotel room door while Marissa and Larry stay out of sight. Thank you, thank you. Drexel interacted with Amanda for some time. They discussed various things that she would be willing to do for him, and then he told her he had to get money out of his car. What's going on? Before he could leave the room, Marissa and Larry walk in. The second that Marissa saw Amanda in the room, she jumped on her. She started beating her, fighting, scratching, clunk, pulled her hair. She was full on attack mode. Sometimes when a person is overcome with anger, instead of confronting the situation in a peaceful or constructive way, they just can't help themselves and respond in many ways through violence. While the two women go at it, Larry stands off to the side with Drexel watching his girlfriend's fury. He didn't lay a hand to break them apart or to stop the violence. I think Larry was a bit flattered by the attention. I think Larry liked the idea that these two women were fighting over him. After watching the two fight for a few minutes, Larry finally pulls them apart and orders Amanda to hand over some money she shorted him. Larry started claiming that Amanda owed him $300. She only had about $150. Unable to produce the full amount owed, Larry drags Amanda to the car, and the group drives back to Drexel's house. Amanda didn't know what was going to happen next. She was scared, and she knew she had no control and no say other than to go where they took her. When they got back to the house on post, Chantrell was shocked to see Amanda with them. Amanda and Marissa engage in this back and forth about Larry and who had had a relationship with him. The two women battle it out, kicking and screaming at each other. Marissa was physically attacking Amanda. At some point in that altercation, Marissa fell and hit her head. She was still mad at Amanda. She's still on her case. And she even told her that she could work off her debt to Larry um, by getting another trick. Um, Amanda 
was becoming more and more afraid and wondering when or if she was going to get out of there. Amanda agrees to get another client to pay her debt, but begs Marissa to let her make a quick call to check on her son. The battled attacker reluctantly agrees, but keeps a watchful eye on her. The single mother makes the call, but instead of talking to her son, her mom picks up the phone. Her mother could hear that she was crying and that she was upset. Amanda becomes emotional hearing her mom's voice. She suspects that her daughter is in trouble and asks if she should call for help. Amanda replies with a yes and hangs up the phone. Amanda's mom knew something was not right. Immediately, she contacted the police, and the police, not knowing where to find Amanda, called her cell phone. The police called the phone number back to see if she was OK. Marissa snatches the phone from Amanda before she can give the cops their whereabouts and disconnects the call. Aware that the police are now involved, the group scrambles to come up with a new plan. I think their main focus was to hide. The police were looking for them. But there's one person standing in their way. They knew that if they let Amanda go, that she could identify them, that she could tell them exactly who they were, and that she could tell the police exactly what had happened and how they had attacked her and assaulted her. They knew what it would mean for Amanda to get away. They had to realize they had gone too far, and now there was no turning back. Amanda had to be silenced permanently. When people start to panic, bad decisions inevitably are made, and the situation just spirals out of control. Larry, Marissa, and Drexel force Amanda in the back of the car and drive to a remote bridge near G remains at the house. According to Larry's plea deal, Marissa continued on her violent path. Once they got to the bridge, Marissa immediately gets out of the car, drags Amanda out of the car, and starts beating her up again. They engage in a physical altercation where Amanda's fighting back and trying to get away. Amanda is able to get out of Marissa's hold and runs. She comes up to the side of the bridge and looks down. She was scared for her life. She knew that if she didn't get away, this was going to be the end. And she jumped. When she jumped off the bridge, she fell 15 to 16 feet and landed on the embankment. Amanda miraculously survives the fall and tries to get up. But this is where her luck runs out. According to Larry's plea deal, Marissa starts to violently attack Amanda yet again. Only this time, she has a weapon. She thought she had a chance to get away. Then she realized her ankle was broken and she couldn't run. And before she knew it, Marissa was right there on top of her, just as angry, but this time with a knife. With eyes full of rage, Marissa swings the knife at the injured woman. She tried to slit her throat, but because of their size difference, she wasn't able to do that. According to Larry's plea deal, he sees that his girlfriend is having a hard time fighting off Amanda. So he steps in. Larry, Marissa, and Drexel run down to stop Amanda, armed with a knife. Larry approached, took the knife from Marissa, and he's the one that actually killed Amanda. As Amanda's lifeless body lay on the ground, her three captors make no effort to cover their brutal crime. They just walked away. They left her body on the embankment. The trio head back to Drexel's house, where they attempt to get rid of anything that can track the murder back to them. They did their best to clean up the evidence of what had happened. Chantrell and Marissa did their best to wash away evidence. Larry and Drexel destroy Amanda's cell phone. They wanted no evidence that Amanda had been with them that day. While the group is covering their tracks, police are already trying to solve the mystery of Amanda's disappearance. Their big break comes two days later, when they find Amanda's body under the bridge six miles outside of Junction City. Investigators search the area, but come up empty-handed. Next, they turn their attention to Amanda's friends to see if they have any idea who could have done this. By talking to her associates, they managed to connect Amanda with Larry. They tracked Larry down to his apartment where they found him with Marissa. The couple is brought down to the station for questioning. 
where they both deny involvement in the murder. But police continue to pry, and eventually Marissa and Larry break down and confess. Although their loyalty to each other has seen its limits. Larry told police that it was Marissa who inflicted the stab that killed Amanda. And Marissa told police that it was Larry who inflicted the, the fatal stab into, into Amanda. So, so their stories didn't add up at all. When couples are under some sort of pressure, especially when we're talking law enforcement, sometimes they'll just turn on one another. After several hours of questioning, Marissa finally comes clean. Marissa told the police that she thought it was her job to teach Amanda a lesson for two reasons. One, she owed Larry money. And two, she was telling lies about her relationship with Larry. She also admits to police that their friends, Chantrell and Drexel Woody, helped out with their plan. Police track the couple down and arrest them for kidnapping resulting in death. They each admit to their part and plead guilty to the charges against them. Drexel Woody is sentenced to 16 years in prison and five years of supervised release. Chantrell's sentence is still pending. Larry Anderson is charged with one count of kidnapping resulting in death. He pleads guilty and is sentenced to 28 years in prison. As for Marissa Middleton, she pleads guilty to conspiracy to commit kidnapping resulting in death. She is sentenced to 28 years in prison. In the end, Marissa let her jealousy and anger consume her thoughts that caused her ultimate downfall. I think Marissa felt like Amanda was a threat to this dream that she had of a life with Larry and was determined to do whatever she needed to do to get her out of the way. People who are amped up on their emotions tend to lose focus, tend to lose uh, perspective and end up hurting not just other people, but even themselves. Marissa lost everything. She lost hope for love, hope for a future. She lost her youth, she lost her freedom. She lost it all for a man. Marissa Middleton's heightened emotions took her down a dark path that turned deadly. In Louisiana, Brandy Holmes is willing to prove her worth to her criminal lover by showing him that she can be just as bad as he can. 12-year-old Shreveport, Louisiana transplant Brandy has lived her life playing second fiddle to a bottle. Brandy's name came from her mother's favorite alcoholic beverage, which was Brandy. Following a nasty divorce, mom's alcohol use doesn't only affect Brandy, but everything around her. She had to be shuffled between mom's house and dad's house, kind of going back and forth between the two, but she spent the majority of her time with her mother. But at an early age, her mom's fondness for the bottle forces Brandy to cope with something she never imagined. The state decides she's no longer fit to be a parent and Brandy learns she's getting a new, unwanted home sweet home. And to her surprise, the state decided to place her in group care under the state's jurisdiction. Children of people who have alcohol and drug issues develop their own psychological issues, their own dysfunctional behaviors. And then to separate from the parents exacerbates the psychological issues, leaving them at times to be very emotionally disturbed. And almost immediately, the troubled young girl lashes out every chance she can. She began to get into fights. She began to use drugs and unfortunately followed in her mother's footsteps and began to drink alcohol. And this was where we started to see this transition turning into criminal behaviors and activities. She was caught entering someone's home, of course, without permission. And she was sent straight to juvie for that. When she's released at 21, Brandy stays with her father and stepmother in Tylertown, Mississippi, until she figures out what to do with her life. Within just a few months, the answer comes unexpectedly when she bumps into 31-year-old Robert Coleman. Robert was this confident, strong, 
muscular guy who had this kind of intimidating persona. Someone that you could kind of feel protected by. Barbara Coleman is a criminal. He has a criminal record, primarily for robberies, which are violent crimes. As the two get to know each other, Brandy thinks the self-admitted bad boy might just be the rock she needs in her life, even if the feelings aren't mutual. He saw her as an opportunity just to have fun, where she looked at him as almost a savior or someone who was going to make things better for her. Brandy was very emotional, and she needed a father figure in her life. So even though Robert was 10 years her senior, this was someone who just was the piece of the puzzle that fit right into place. As time passes, the two become inseparable. But when Brandy realizes that her new man requires proof of her devotion, they come up with a game for her to commit the most unspeakable acts, all in the name of love. All she really needed was a positive influence to help her turn her life around. But instead, she got the opposite. She probably would have followed him into the pits of hell if it need be. Following a rough childhood, young Brandy Holmes falls hard and fast for ex-con Robert Coleman, one year after she's released from juvenile jail in Tylertown, Mississippi. For the first time in her life, Brandy felt some real stability with Robert. It brought a real warm and fuzzy feeling called love that made her feel really great. And that was something that she needed, that she wanted, that she enjoyed. That winter, after only a couple of months of dating, the pair decides to move in together and relocate to Shreveport, Louisiana, where her mother and now 15-year-old brother are still living. They decided to live with her mother. Well, they kind of figured things out to save up money to get their own place. Apparently, she wasn't that concerned about her mother's alcoholism at that point. Okay. Unfortunately, finding a job is easier said than done. Brandy never worked a day in her life. Absolutely no job history at all. Robert, his criminal background and not necessarily having substantial jobs or educational experience either, the chances for them to get legitimate work were really slim to none. With no hopes for the future, Robert decides it's time to resort to what he does best, criminal activity. And he comes up with this brilliant idea to get a gun that that's going to be the number one thing that they need in order to start getting some sort of an income. Robert suggested that they would stick up homes, nice residential homes. It's the provincial easy money scheme. My dad has Brandy remembered that her father had a 38 caliber gun in his nightstand in his home. So they developed a plan to kind of go down there and see them. That December, the lovebirds spend a night with Dad and his wife in Tylerville, steal the gun, and return without them being the wiser. For Brandy to take her father's gun, even though it was going to be used for some sort of a criminal enterprise, she saw it as a victimless crime. And therefore, to do this was just really no big deal for her whatsoever. With gun in hand, Robert's plan starts to take shape. However, they're no longer talking simple robbery. He wants to make sure his girl is up for anything, no matter how sinister. Brandy basically was told by Robert they're going to play the knockout game and to prove her loyalty and love to him. They were going to rob someone, burglarize their home, knock them out, and kill them. And he told her that this would be a way for her to kind of prove her loyalty and her steadfastness in the sense of taking an individual's life without even thinking about it. Surprisingly, Brandy doesn't shy away from the idea one bit. She's excited for the chance to solidify their bond once and for all. Brandy met someone who brought out the worst in her. Robert was making crime seem like it was a lot of fun and therefore was slowly but surely corrupting her mind. The following afternoon, on New Year's Day, Brandy and Robert begin casing middle-class houses. And it doesn't take long to spot the home of 70-year-old retired minister Julian Brandon and his 68-year-old wife Alice in Blanchard, about 10 miles outside of Shreveport. Julian and Alice Brandon were a nice elderly couple. 
They were just good, fun-loving people. Everybody's friend, everybody's family member, always willing to lend a hand and help those in the community. It's just after 7 o'clock as the Brandons begin to settle in for the night. Just then, there's an unexpected knock on the door. When Reverend Brandon went to open the door, Robert and Brandy were outside the door. Hello? Immediately, within a split of a second, Robert takes the gun, he puts it underneath the Reverend's chin, and he shot him. Instantly, the holy man crumples to the floor as his terrified wife looks on in horror. And they grab her and kind of drag her into the back room, and they demand for all of her valuables, credit cards, money, jewelry, any and everything, and she gives it away without even thinking about it. She's afraid. She knows that this vicious couple probably mean to do her harm. And so she is hoping that begging Brandy to help her, she would survive this vicious attack. But before Brandy has a chance to make a moral decision, Robert hands her the gun and says, do it. And there was no stopping her. Robert was just an evil man. And he wanted his woman to be as equally violent. After breaking into the Shreveport, Louisiana home of Reverend Julian and Alice Brandon, shooting the man of the house and robbing his shocked widow, Robert Coleman hands the gun to his girlfriend, Brandy Holmes, telling her it's time to prove her moxie. Robert wanted someone who was a puppet, someone he could manipulate and corrupt, and he got that from Brandy, almost to the point where she didn't even care what happened to this elderly couple that they were robbing. Without hesitation, Brandy grabs a nearby pillow, places it over Alice's face, and pulls the trigger. It was clear that Brandy had crossed a certain line that she would not be able to come back from. Just then, as the couple looks on at the massacre in front of them, they hear a groan coming from the main room. It's Reverend Brandon, and it appears he's been resurrected. They thought that he was dead. In fact, he wasn't, and he was trying to hold on to these last seconds of his life. Following the principle that no one is to be left alive, they went to the kitchen, grabbed some knives, and began to stab him ferociously. They actually left the knife lodged in his back. Brandy not only wanted to prove to her man that she could do anything that he threw at her, but she wanted to go beyond his expectations, and she did that through her cold and calculating actions. With the deed done, the loathsome lovebirds head out to enjoy the fruits of their labor. They attempted to use the ATM cards, but were not successful because they did not have the pin codes. So all they could do was sell the jewelry and all the other valuables to local pawn shops to get money. However, as Brandy tries to unload some of Alice's keepsakes, she has a tough time controlling her excitement. Brandy felt almost like an adrenaline rush from killing the Brandons. She now had a badge of honor given to her by the love of her life, which made her feel even better. In fact, she doesn't hesitate to run her mouth to several folks around town. She began to brag about the fact that she had killed Mrs. Brandon and that her and Robert had committed this horrible crime. We've seen this time and time again, killers who can't wait to brag about the horrific things that they've done. This is their red badge of courage, if you will but she then felt that she could naturally just talk to anybody else about it and get away with that kind of talk. Unfortunately, she's about to face the music when four days later, folks at the Brandon's church notice there's a key member missing that Sunday. Reverend Brandon didn't show up for his weekly Bible study, and people at the church found that very odd. One friend in particular went with his wife over to the Brandon home and found the front door open. As the pal cautiously makes his way inside, he's met with the shock of his life. It was like a blood massacre walking around there, blood spatters everywhere, gunshot wounds. And seeing Mr. Brandon's body there, he immediately called the police. Within minutes, officers arrive and begin canvassing the home, trying to make sense of what went down. Just then, as they make their way into the rear bedroom, they find Alice Brandon, 
and miraculously, she's clinging to life. Initially, they thought she was deceased, but then they heard her gurgling, sounds kind of coming out. So against all odds, she was surviving. She was immediately airlifted to a local hospital. Meanwhile, police scour the house for clues, but find no fingerprints anywhere, not even on the knife Robert plunged into the Reverend's back. However, they do tread on something worthwhile. They did find a shoe print in a pool of blood that was close to Mr. Brandon's body. The shoe size was a size nine, it was for a man's boot. As detectives wrap up their sweep of the scene, news crews are encasing the Brandon's home. And it doesn't take long for word of the brutal attack to spread through northern Louisiana, especially when police ask for help. Immediately, it was aired on all these local channels and all the TV, and individuals were made aware of this brutal incident that happened in their community, which was really rare. And certainly, it made the community uneasy to understand that someone would commit such a horrendous act. Before long, leaves start pouring into the Caddo Parish Sheriff's Office. And one tip stands out among the rest, revealing the most twisted and perverse love story the Bayou State has ever heard. They worked so hard not to have anything left on the scene, but that became their undoing. In Shreveport, Louisiana, investigators are searching for whomever robbed and attacked Reverend Brandon and his wife Alice a week ago, killing him and leaving her permanently disabled. And she fought and fought and fought for her life, but unfortunately, she basically was a vegetable at that particular point. This is as worse as worse gets when it comes to a crime. And they were so cocky about this that they just thought they could just act in any way they wanted to without any consequences whatsoever. Fortunately, as the leads come pouring in, investigators get an anonymous tip that Brandy has been running her mouth, taking credit for the brutal attacks. With that anonymous tip, that gave the police a suspect that they could kind of hone in on and go to find out more details. Within hours, went to her mother's home, and Brandy was there. And so was Robert and Brandy's mother and her younger brother. They were all taken down to the station for additional questioning. Not knowing if one or all of the people in the house are involved, police interview each family member separately, starting with the girl who sparked the tip. When the police asked Brandy about the crime, she led them to believe that she had no idea that there was a crime and that she was completely oblivious to everything that they were talking about. Detectives don't believe her and take note of her cold, calculated persona. However, as the talk continues, they notice a soft side when she discusses her younger brother. So they decide to lay an emotional trap. He said, if we let your mother and your brother go home, will you give us a truthful statement? And Brandy agreed. He was with me. At that particular point, she fell for the bait that they put out, and she started to tell a little bit of the truth, but not everything. It was all my idea. This was the only mushy spot in what seemed to be a very resilient exterior. Once the cops picked up on it, they used it to their advantage. After police determine mom and brother are completely innocent of any wrongdoing, they keep their promise and release them. That's when Brandy admits that she stole her father's handgun while visiting him in Mississippi and claims that she was the shooter of both victims. It was me. She even goes so far as to say she did all the stabbing herself and Robert wasn't even there. It was all me, I did all of it. I think that Brandy lost her humanity after participating in this horrific crime. The only thing she ever wanted was to do what Robert told her. Even till the bitter end, she was still trying to protect him, even though she lost all semblance of self. Although they don't believe her story, they decide to take it at face value until they hear what her boy toy has to say and his disloyalty quickly comes shining through. Barbara denied any involvement in the crime, so quite the opposite of Brandy, who took all of the responsibility. He denied being there, he denied knowing about it. But detectives have no doubt he's backpedaling. The police noticed blood splatter on his boot, and immediately they confiscated it and took it to the lab. 
He took such meticulous effort to make sure that no evidence was left behind at the crime scene. But he's walking around in the clothes in which he actually killed the Brandons. Police have enough to hold the pair on suspicion of murder, and they're placed under arrest. And any doubt of their guilt is erased by the tests done on Robert's clothing. The lab work came back with blood matching the Brandons, and the shoe print that was found was a perfect match for that found in the blood pool. Brandy is charged with one count of first-degree murder and one count of attempted first-degree murder. She is convicted on the murder charge, but the attempted murder count is thrown out. Robert is charged and convicted of first-degree murder. They are both given the death penalty. Each appeals their sentence and receives life in prison. Robert did appeal his case when it was discovered that one of the jurors was excluded from participating because he was African-American. As a result of that particular error, he was granted a new trial, but the result was still the same. He was found guilty of murder. During her time behind bars, Brandy has never shown remorse for her actions. Given Brandy's very dysfunctional upbringing and the resultant rage that she felt about it, this was a young woman who was a ticking time bomb. She was going to go off at some time. And I believe the detonator was Robert. And this coming together resulted in the serious injury of one person and the death of another. Brandy became a monster for her man. He had tested her toughness, and she'd come through with flying colors, that she was willing to do whatever it takes to be a vicious criminal. Brandy was a killing machine. It was like she was a weapon. I mean, literally, figuratively, in every sense of the word, she would do absolutely anything for her man. And in this particular case, it was clear she would have done anything anything 